pride of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. Welcome to this uh, April 18th Board of Commissioners meeting. The first item of business, as always, is public comment, which is for anyone not on the agenda. We will move on. Uh, I believe our first item is Mr. Steve Felty with a request for a speed reduction, but I don't see him here, so we will, if he shows up, we'll move back to that. Uh, next is Esmeralda Cruz with a program update. Good morning, Good morning. I do have a PowerPoint. Is there a way to plug this in to show, or if uh, not, I can do it verbally. Our tech guy's right here, so uh, <laughs> yeah, it would definitely take a minute. <laughs> so should I just plan on doing the verbal? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pictures are always great, but I know sometimes I'm just gonna get my agenda to make sure that I cover everything that I'm hoping to today. Um, so I'm sure you're all aware of the loss that we've had in our community, the accident in Mexico. Um, I wanted to share with you all that we've been working behind the scenes with the families to try to figure out the process that the families will be going through in order to ensure that if they want to bring their loved one's ashes back to the United States, that they will be able to do that. So we're working with the Mexican consulate. This is pretty new to us. You know, we've had families that have wanted to take once the loved ones have passed away here back to Mexico, but not the other way around. So um, it sounds like the process won't be as expensive as it is when we're taking a body, but still there's some expenses involved. All of the families have made it down to Mexico to recognize and identify their loved ones. Um, so the, the process of grief right now has been very difficult for them because instead of being with family, they're having to make travel arrangements and, and get all of that done. Um, the other thing that we've been working on as a community is trying to figure out how do we make it as possible for this family to grieve and know that the community is behind them and, and supporting them. And so uh, we've been in communication with the mayor. We're hoping to do a candle vigil the thing about that is we can't set a date yet until we know when these families are coming back. We'd like for them to be a part of that, but please know that um, we are getting approval too from the families to make sure that they want to be included in that and that they're okay with us including their loved one as a part of the of, of the ceremony. Um, so as, as of now, the families that we've been able to get a hold of, they all said yes, thank you so much, and now we're just waiting on those that are going to be returning to figure out a date. The other thing that we've been working on is for community members that want to provide financial support to these families, there's been loss of income. Um, we know that we lost at least you know, two fathers um, and they were breadwinners in their families. So we are setting up a uh, page so that anybody that wants to make a financial contribution, the Learning Network has accepted to be um, the not-for-profit organization that's gonna be sort of the donations hub. We do know at least two families have created their own GoFundMe pages. The reason why we thought it was important to create one through the community is for families that don't feel comfortable with technology and they still need financial support. Also, because um, some of our community members may not know the families directly, but they may want to contribute towards the general fund. So the Learning Network, which is lnocc.org, that's where people can go to. Um, it's, it's set up now, lnocc.org. If you just scroll down, there's going to be one place that says in memoria, which means in memory. Everything is English and Spanish. You click on support, and then you click on donate. When you click on donate, there's a different fund for each one of the five families that was affected, and then there's one that's a general fund. So whether you want to make a contribution to a specific family or the general fund, whatever it is, it will be welcome. Um, the goal is anything that's raised on the general fund will be divided among the families that will be affected, that, that are affected. Um, and, and so that is up and running. So that's just an update on on that tragedy that has happened. Well, please, please let us know if there's anything that we can do to help. I know you talked about doing uh, something for mayor and vigilant. If we can be involved in any capacity or, or okay. utilization, please let us know. Thank so. you so much. And, and there's other businesses um, 
one of my colleagues had a meeting yesterday at CNR Catering. Did I get that right? Okay. Uh, so I know there's going to be some shirts for sale. There's going to be a bake sale, a tamale sale. Um, the catering company is going to be having a food sale event this Friday. I believe it's from 4 30 to 7 30. I was just told this morning and I didn't write down all the details. So I know there's going to be things coming up. What we've kind of decided is anything that's raised from these fundraisers will go into the general fund unless somebody says otherwise so uh, another way that people can donate is through the farmers bank um, our accountant from the learning network has talked with the farmers bank to set up a budget line item for in memory so that's another way that people can go and make a contribution thank you we will make sure to try to keep the community abreast of what's happening in terms of support for the families um, and, and kind of changing gears a little bit, uh, the Frankfurt Hispanic Heritage Festival last year, very successful event where we have our next one programmed for Saturday, September 16th. So as always, please know you're welcome. We always invite the community. We want to see everybody has had great attendance. We're seeing people come in, not just from the community, but from surrounding uh, cities, which is pretty wonderful to see. All the way up from um, Chicago, people are coming down to the festival. So. We're looking forward to continuing that. Um, we uh, are going to be bringing in some some new some new things. I don't want to say too much about it because I'd rather have you guys see it in person. But just know that you're welcome. Pretty Creek Park, four to ten thirty on Saturday, September sixteenth. Um, in terms of, we have a program called Grassroots Leadership Development Program, and Josh Hewitt was actually one of our speakers. This is a pretty fantastic program. We have a group this year. We had a, and this is a year-round program, and students start in the summer, so they have to be really committed because over the summertime, they literally give us five weeks, which is more than half of their break. Um, but for five weeks, they're coming in twice a week to our office, and they're connecting with community leaders and and public officials all the way, you know, from commissioners to superintendent to the mayor, to the chief of police, chief of fire. Um, and during this one hour engagement with the, with each one of these public officials, they get to learn about how does our community work. One of the biggest takeaways for these students is realizing everything that happens behind the scenes and how budget how budgets work, how how they're leveraged, um, how decisions are made in terms of prioritizing projects. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that they realize why there really is so much happening we just don't see it firsthand so we don't appreciate it but now they they do and they share it um, one of the things so during the summertime they meet with public officials and this year they met with 24 public officials and that qualified them to go to the national conference so we which did take place thank goodness it had been a couple years since it had um, this year, the attendance wasn't as high as the national conference, but still there were 3,500 people coming from all over 50 states, plus even from like Puerto Rico, um, people coming in from Puerto Rico as well. So the only reason why we can take these students to the national conference is because of the 24 speakers that are give, willing to give an hour of their time, uh, because they get to complete the grassroots leadership development program, and then the registration, which is around $350, $350 a piece, it's free. And then we just take care of their um, uh, transportation and lodging. This year, our sponsors for those two things were um, Jose and Carolina Cruz and the Farmers Sink. They donated so that we could cover those expenses for our students. Once that summer portion is over, the students then choose a project that they want to implement during the school year. And this year, they chose mentoring slash tutoring. They learned from the superintendent and from other school administrators that the literacy levels among our students coming back from COVID have decreased and they're struggling a little bit. And so our students said, how can we help be a part of the solution? So starting in September through, we're going right now and it's gonna be going through May, um, they're meeting with a group of students at Suncrest Elementary on a weekly basis for an hour. And we do, monthly themed activities but they focus primarily on, on literacy but also relationship building to become a role model for these students so it's personally it's one of the most favorite projects that these students have chosen so far because we're seeing the impact um, with, with, with those kids and we couldn't do that without the support of Lori North and Leslie Miller who work with the community schools of Frankfurt who helped us create that partnership and thanks to the TAC program because they make the kids have transportation home um, 
the other thing, and this will be the final thing, because I know you guys have a lot on the agenda. I've, I'm a part of a, a team, uh, and this is a state team, so we, we do have a report for you. We've been working for a couple of years now on a financial uh, literacy research study with the Linux community in the state of Indiana. So what we've been trying to find out is what are the financial literacy needs and barriers to access for the Linux community? Because as you know, we have a huge, a huge Linux population here in Clinton County. We're not the only one. We're one of the top four in the state. And so all of those four counties were very intentionally included in this research study, but we had nine, count, nine counties total. This started back in 20, 2020. So phase one, that's what you're looking at right now. This, this, these, we did some focus groups. Let me think, I think we did seven groups, seven focus groups total. The largest percentage of participants were from Clinton County. We had 18 people participate in these focus groups just to give us feedback into their experiences in terms of financial literacy, how much they knew, how much they trusted some of the financial sectors. Honestly, even I was blown away by some of these numbers in terms of lack of what they feel to be their knowledge level and also lack of trust, which go hand in hand, right? If we don't understand something, it's really hard to trust them. So, so that makes sense. But in terms of how high those percentages were, um, the, the highest one was a retirement, which that's concerning. Because if, if, if we're thinking that you know our population doesn't understand the retirement or why it's important to put towards that or how it works, we're going to see the impacts of that once they retire. Um, and so then we decided the numbers weren't high enough. We had, I think it was 36, and you're, you're going to see the numbers on there. That's why I wanted to make sure you had it. I think we have 36 people total in the focus group. So that wasn't a high group. So then we knew we needed our qualitative data was great. We learned a lot, but the quantitative wasn't there. So in, in a year later, in 2022, we did phase two, which were um, a, a, through a survey. And we had 316 surveys completed across the nine counties. So we're doing, we've done some preliminary data analysis, but we're still working on the in-depth release part two of the report. One of the things that the team is discussing currently, okay, now we know some of these things. Now what do we do? How, how do we help? How, how do we become a part of the solution in terms of what has been expressed to us? So that's where we're at. Right now I'm working with a student from Purdue University who's completing her master's in public health. We're gonna be writing a grant to do a pilot here in Plant County in terms of bridging some of this information and some of the cultural differences to try to see what sort of impact we can have and then see if that's something that can be either replicated at a bigger scale or modified to, to do a bigger outreach. Um, oh. And we actually were nominated for a national award and we have been selected to receive the national award. I cannot tell you yet which one it is because it's gonna be at the end of the month and they told us please don't say what it is yet because we wanna to, to release it. But at the end of this month, that's gonna be awarded and we've been nominated for two state awards. So just to let you know, there's great things happening and some of it takes time, two years of, of work, but we're learning and, and now we're trying to do our best to try to address some of the things that we're learning. And that's it for me. Do you all have any questions? Well done. Okay. Thank well you. Done. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate getting this update because as you mentioned in the beginning about having uh, Josh and, and other public figures come and speak and all the stuff that goes beyond on behind the scenes. It's no different than you tell us. We know the programs are out there. But the update tells us kind of the meat and potatoes of what's happening and the impact it's having on lives in our community. So thank you so much for all your work. Thank you for the opportunity and your time. Next up is uh, Chris, Chris Wheatley with BFNS. We have an administrative settlement, uh, which is for, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, the offer for the dope property on the north side of uh, Sierra 28 for the roundabout project. Thank you. Chris Wheatley with the FNS. Um, I've given you four copies. Uh, this is an administrative settlement for the parcel um, that will that we need for an easement for the drainage to connect from the um, Sarah 2800 project to the existing county legal drain 
on the north side of the project. Okay. Any questions or comments? What you got? I'll entertain a motion. Will you need four signatures, Chris? No, I think one, one will. Okay. Right. I'll make a motion to approve the administrative settlement. And I'll second that. Okay, your motion carries three Thank zero. You. Okay, next up we have, we have two proposals and the if you remember from a few meetings ago, uh, we had an issue with getting our ADA compliance up to standard uh, so we could receive federal grants, one being the community crossing one, which we did receive and we'll talk about here a little later. Uh, so the first presentation on uh, continuing that updating is from Sarah Huss in BLZ. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Um, I had been speaking with Jerry about um, how we could help you guys with this. We did the original transition plan, if you remember. Um, when we did that plan originally, it was broken out over several years in order to help with some budgetary constraints uh, at that point in time. Um, so we would be taking that existing plan and um, updating everything within that plan. Um, unfortunately, when you update these plans, there's a, a lot of work that is redone. Um, so we would be completely reviewing all the programs and policies again. It's obviously as administrations change, things change, and it's been 2017, so you know, five, six years um, since this was done last. Um, so we would redo that entire programs and policies analysis. Um, we would go back in and um, we, we had talked through the buildings that you guys have acquired or uh, renovated since that time. And so we would evaluate those new facilities uh, and those renovated facilities. Um, and then we would completely redo all the public outreach as well, um, since obviously your constituents change um, and uh, people's needs change as well. Um, so we have uh, the first portion of that would be the uh, ADA self-evaluation transition plan update. Um, and we are looking at about 19,500 for that. Um, the second part of this update uh, that was put in here for your consideration uh, the first time around, the guidance wasn't quite clear yet on employee common use areas. Um, so the first evaluations that we did did not include those. Um, they looked only at the public areas of the facilities. Um, so there is a recommended optional services, which would be going back into the facilities um, that we already evaluated and picking up those areas. Um, the thing that's challenging about doing that is, you know, we didn't look at those the first time, so we don't have a good handle on how extensive those spaces are in those facilities. Um, and so for that, we included that as an hourly rate service. So basically we would just charge you guys for um, the time it takes us to do that. That protects you guys, it protects us so that um, everybody gets the work done in, a, in an orderly fashion there. Um, and then the other service that we included uh, that's required by NDOT is your Title VI plan, um, which you have one in place, but it is missing some key elements. Um, and one of the big parts of that is looking and reviewing all of the census tracts and understanding what your population is um, that you're, you're trying to address with the Title VI plan. Um, so there would be a pretty big update to that one as well. And that one we're looking at about $7,900 for. Um, so if you look at our proposal, there are, um, are basically three different check boxes on the things that um, we are providing or could provide um, to our lump sum items. That's the transition plan update and the Title VI plan update, and then the optional hourly is that employee common use area evaluations that I mentioned. Does anyone have any? Oh, no, the one other thing that we wanted to make sure that we pointed out um, in the letter that Jerry received, um, they did put a 120 day limit on completing your updates. Um, in our opinion, that's not super realistic for a, a thorough transition plan update. Um, and that was the other reason that we gave you kind of some checkbox choices. Um, we know that we can get the Title VI done for you, no problem. Um, the other plan to do properly, we think is gonna take longer than that. Um, so previously, and that was pretty helpful. Um, if people were under contract to get the work done, they were counting that as moving towards your goal um, and amenable to that, but that's a conversation that you guys would need to have directly with them and make sure that that was okay. But I just wanted to make you aware of that the transition plan schedule does not meet their 
current request. Does anyone have any questions? What would, what would the time frame for the transition plan be? Um, I believe we were out into the beginning of October with that. 165 days okay. was our timeline. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, next up we have uh, Tim Clark with Impact. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Tim Clark with Impact. I live here in Tim Clinton County, and I was contacted by Jerry to come in and talk to her about what all you guys have and what you are looking for. Um, honestly, I think that you guys are trying to figure out what you're looking for. And that's part of what I do. Um, I work with the city of West Lafayette. If you want to call anybody, talk to the mayor, John Dennis over there. I worked with them for over eight years, getting their whole entire program put together. And it's not an easy process, she just said. <laughs> it's a lengthy process. So I'm just here to help you guys figure out what it is that you don't have and what you need and meet federal, federal regulations. All the way from your trails to OPDMD, which I don't even say what does that stand for. Other power driven mobility devices. Do you even have a policy, uh, procedures in place for any of this stuff? So we're here to help in any way that we can to get you guys where you need to be in this whole entire process. Okay. Questions? Um, Tim, I understand that you have worked with Jerry a little bit already, and I appreciate the fact that you were able to give her some guidance right off the bat. I appreciate that. No problem. Thanks. Okay. I would say that we uh, take them under advisement and we'll review both proposals and we'll make a selection at our uh, next meeting. So thank you. thank you both for coming and presenting those to us. All right. Next up is uh, Rick Campbell with the Highway Update. Good morning, Rick. <coughs> Morning. <clears throat> the guys are still spreading gravel roads. We're still patching and we're still dragging roads. We found out early Wednesday, last Wednesday morning, that we had received the CCMG grant money of a million dollars to do Kelly Road, which is 150 South. And I have, we've been working on a uh, yeah advertisement to bid that we need to have the commissioners and the auditor sign so that we can send it back to the state and they can advertise for for uh, bids. Okay. So we need to do the resolution first. Or do you think it's different? Okay. All right. So I'll entertain a motion to. Uh, Advertise for bids for the Unity Crossings Grant uh, Road Project on 150 South. First of all, Rick, good work on doing that and getting that in to begin with. Mm -hmm. I'll make that motion that we move forward with that. I'll second. Okay. Motion We're also working on a right. yeah. yeah. motion carries 3 0. Okay, sorry. We're also working on giving a letter of proposal for Bridge 115 and ready to submit to the state. So that we can uh, do scoring and select a consultant, and we have to have this done by September 1st, and September 1st is going to come real quick. So we're working on that now. And, and Bridge 115 is also on Kelly Road. On Kelly Road, yeah. between Williams Williams Road and Alhambra. Yeah. That'll mess things up. <laughs> um, and. Uh, <coughs> We would also like to do summer hours again this year, uh, nine hour days and half a day on Friday. Um, it would start uh, May 30th and it would go until sub, to September 4th, which would be uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day. Okay. I think, uh, I yeah. 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 So, motion to approve that. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Three zero. Also, at the first of the year, I ordered a new uh, patch truck, a Ford 450 Super Duty, and it came in last week, and we picked it up and took it to Clark to get the bed put on it. The bed's not ready yet, but as soon as the bed's ready, like, 
they'll put that on there for us. Okay. Um, we met with the EMA director about FEMA paperwork, and we have to have it turned in by Friday. And as soon as we got back to the office last Friday, we started working on that, and we're coming along with that road. We should be ready. Um, our big roller quit working, and we got another used one off of Central Paving. And I was wondering if we could go ahead and, and jump the old one. You don't, there's no use for it to no. keep it around? No. Did you just scrap it? We just want to scrap it. Okay. <clears throat> that. Works for me right now. Okay. I don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. All yeah. yeah. That's yeah. All I got. Okay. Before you go, I just want to congratulate you. I don't think people realize the amount of work and the amount of money that your department has brought in to this community and specifically the unincorporated parts of Clinton County. So none of the towns, not Frankfurt, but you guys have brought in by my calculation since 2017, just over $6 million in road funding. That's phenomenal. Thank you. I don't, I don't know that there's anybody that's got a street like we've got on the community crossing. So. Thank you. Job well done to everyone involved. So. Thank you. Well, thank you. We worked real hard being the first ones to answer the questions. Yeah. Get the questions answered first because I like that makes a big difference. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that's roughly five miles of road, correct? Roughly five miles yeah. of road. Five miles of road. I talked with Bruce Spears last week that does the. Uh, Helps us with that community crossing, and he seems to think we'll have we'll have plenty of money. The price of the hot mix is, seems to be going down right now, so okay. we should be good awesome. shape. Yep. And just to clarify, that's a, a 75-25 match. So the, right, the, right. The grants for a million, and then the county will contribute the 25 percent. I believe it's the eighth year in a row. Is it, is it not the eighth? Yeah. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Seven, seven years. Seven years. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, John. Tell your men that. I will. <clears throat> Tom, do we have that? Uh, do we have that resolution? Okay. Since we've already brought it out, we might as well just uh, throw that in here. So there's a resolution 2023-01, uh, which uh, authorizes the commissioners to execute the NDOT agreement. So to accept the community crossings, we have to. Uh, create a resolution. So that is what this would be. So I'll entertain the motion uh, to to accept this resolution. So I'm second. All right. Motion carries three zero. Okay. Next up is uh, Liz Stitzel with the area plan update. Good morning, Liz. Good morning. Just having a way around. <laughs> um, I don't have time this morning. Um, Kat reminded me before I came that we still don't have a mower. By some miracle, we don't have any mowing complaints yet. I... We got a mower. Do we have a mower? Yeah, okay, sorry. awesome. I thought I, I meant to send that to you, and apparently I did not. So my we, no, no such information. So Kat's just starting to get nervous because even though we haven't gotten complaints, now that it's growing, we figure we're going to start hearing from at least the regular site. So. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> So, okay, yeah, if you can just send us in the info to whoever you signed the contract with, so Kat knows who to reach out to, we'll follow up on that. So, um, trying to think what else. Um, the House on Farmer's Gravel, uh, they took that down. Uh, there's still a garage there. We've got to go out and analyze that. If the garage is not collapsing, then we're probably going to have to start over with a repair order. If there's broken windows or locks of doors and then if they don't repair it then or to at least a secure level then we'll be back around to tearing it down because it's not repaired but um we need to take a look at that if the roof on that is collapsing which my understanding is not then you know we could proceed with taking it down now but it's just a standalone building now so figuring out the best path but it can't just be left gaping open with you know, parts of it broken, the property maintenance ordinance does require um, those things to be in good repair. 
doesn't require to be painted a particular color or anything, but um, but it's supposed to have a weatherproof exterior surface and um, intact windows and be secured with the door of some sort. So if those things are not all true, we can deal with that. So the owner took it down. The owner did take okay. it down. The, the everything except the, the garage. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where that's at the moment. Um, Liz, I've had a call, um, and I'm not exactly sure of the address, but I would say Mulberry Jefferson Blacktop and what I would call Camp Cullum Road out towards Mulberry. There's a property that I think in the years past have been a battle for quite some time. A lot There's of trash. couple in there. That I, I, remember. I don't remember what the name or the situation was, but I understand there's a lot of stuff and trash. And okay. On Mul Mulberry Jefferson near camp, the Camp Cullum. Yeah. intersection it's at the intersection and actually okay. then it would be to the south of that uh, um, intersection okay we'll see if we side. can find it yeah. if you do happen to come across an address like yeah. yeah send that over but we'll see if we can drive that area and locate it. it's real bad so that know. intersection is right on the corner i think we've addressed okay. it multiple times before okay. in the years past i know there's some out that way that yeah. come up and settle and then come up and the settle. neighbor across the street's complaining that there's rats running back and forth yeah. and so forth so Okay. We need to look at it, I think. Yep, we'll send Thank somebody you. out there. I'll let Kat know. We'll try to get some staff out there. Find it. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. We have two items for old business. The first one is ordinance 2023-03, which is the amendment of the ARPA ordinance of 2022-12. As you recall from our last meeting, uh, Councillor Dunn brought up the funding issue for the roundabout and that there, uh, this would contribute $1 million of the ARPA funds to the roundabout project. Anything else that Tom um, will need to mention? So we've had this, this draft to review, so I'll entertain any thoughts, questions, or a motion. Do you have anything? No, 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 no. I'll make a motion to approve ordinance 2023 03, amending the ARPA ordinance 2022 12. And I will second that. Okay, motion carries 3 0. The next item is we had uh, two appointments on the Board of Health open. We filled the one vacancy. A month or so ago and so this is the second vacancy which is uh, more specific because it has to be uh, md so we have a recommendation do you want to talk any on it rodney or do you want me to kind of go through it uh, I, I know that a former board member highly recommended uh, Dr. Will, so yes. I'll, and I'll let you okay. elaborate further all right so it, uh, the recommendation is for dr carly wilson she couldn't be here today she's obviously working so uh, she sent in some notes and i'll just kind of go through through those so we're familiar with her and that it's, it's out there she's been a resident of clinton county since 2005 resides here with her husband uh, joel wilson and their two children uh, she went to medical school at des moines university and did residency training in the family medicine at grandview hospital in dayton ohio she was recruited to Clinton County in Frankfurt by St. Vincent's in 2005 and worked in their outpatient and inpatient practice. Uh, she transitioned to a full-time hospitalist inpatient medicine for St. Vincent in 2015 and then transitioned to IU Frankfurt from 2017 to 2019. She currently works for IU Tipton Hospital and she is the medical director for the Guardian Angel Hospice since uh, 2011. So uh, I spoke with her. I think she'll be an excellent addition to that board. And as Rodney mentioned, she comes uh, recommended. So I will uh, entertain any thoughts on that or if you want to move forward or not. I've had the opportunity over the years to know her. And I think she is more than capable of being a great assistance. And I think it's a good uh, a match for our county and for our community. So I would highly recommend that you know, she would be approved. So with that, I'd be glad to make a motion that we uh, accept her as the uh, new Board of Health appointment. I'll second the motion to appoint Dr. Wilson. OK. 
Okay, motion carries 3-0. Dr. Wilson is now on the uh, Board of Health Board for a four-year appointment. I believe the board is now full. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we move on to uh, new business. Our first item is we have a travel and expense policy update, uh, which we're kind of getting a little ahead of ourselves because it's part of the larger handbook um, update that will be rolling out here really soon. However, it went through council, so now it needs to come through the commissioners. Uh, I believe the update is for the maximum reimbursement for uh, meals and uh, also I believe the overnight stay. Is that correct, Britt? Both of those changed. So uh, we, we talked about this in our HR meeting um, and it got rolled out. So. I guess just to be consistent, I'll entertain a motion to accept these changes to the travel and expense policy. So my second. All right. Motion carries 3-0 uh, for the new effective travel and expense policy as of April 3rd. Next item was the uh, resolution, which we lumped up with our highway update. So we will move on to our, uh, we have Paul Phillippe notification of de-obligation of federal and state transit funds. So uh, this is just, uh, we act as the pass-through for Paul Phillippe. They had money left over from their grant that they had to turn back in. So we have to uh, make a motion to accept to send that money back. So that is what, uh, what this is. Any questions? How much was the? The it was a hundred and eighteen thousand four hundred and fifty-one dollars that was turned back into the to the federal grant amount. So I'll entertain a motion to to accept that. Um, motion to accept the amount that was being returned on the federal grants. Philippine notification. Second. Okay. Motion carries 3 0. Next item uh, we have two engagement letters from Baker Tilly. Uh, these are for arbitrage monitoring services. So uh, a requirement by the IRS and the U.S. Treasury for debt obligation is to have uh, a monitoring service, a financial advisor, monitor the debt obligation. So we are engaging uh, Baker Tilly to do this arbitrage monitoring for our uh, tax anticipated, or our local income tax bond anticipation notes of 2019 for the water project. 19 for the sewer project, 20 for the phase two of the water project, and 21 for the water and sewer project. Uh, that would be the first engagement letter that I'll entertain a motion for, and then we have a second one as well. So we're legally obligated to do this? Yes. Why would it matter to us who buys <coughs> those bonds? Why would we need somebody to monitor that? I think the monitoring is from the IRS while we have the debt under our name, I believe, if I'm understanding the, the is an arbitrage, is that when someone buy someone else buys the bonds from whoever issued them to us in the first place? We have no we don't have a, a dog in the fight. Baker Tilly asked for us to sign up, so you guys can get the help for it. Okay. Okay, so do you want to table the first one until you find out more information on it? I do because I don't, obviously I don't understand it. Okay, so we have a, a motion to table. Do we have well, a second? We have engaged them before. Um, they have actually helped us before, I believe, when ConAgra was here and then when did the road. Um, you know, Baker Tilly has been uh, engaged with us for a long time, so I really have no problem doing that. And I think because of the bond situation, I think they're just trying okay. to keep us compliant with everything. Yeah. It just seems so, like that. I mean, if we engage them to help us issue, but why would we have to re engage them for something else? Why, why would this include? Uh, you know what I mean? <coughs> I think that 
want to engage the before. It, it sounds like next it's time resolved. Time. You know, we, we fixed it that time, and now it's a new project. Well, if if I understood it correctly, regardless if it's Baker Tilly, we were required to have someone monitor the bonds while we have them. So. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll make the motion that we go forward with Baker Tilly engagement letter. Okay, so that's the first one. We have a motion. I'll be the second. Josh, nay, nay. So two, two, one to accept the uh, Baker Tilly arbitrage monitoring service. And then we have a second one, uh, same thing, but it is for the uh, economic development and income tax lease rental bond of 2017. So, it's exact same. Exactly the same. Yeah. Yep. So a motion to approve. Okay. Second. Motion carries to two one. I'll, I'll sign this after. Oh. Okay. okay. Next up is uh from Envoy, it's a change order, which is a little misleading. It's for the relocation of the power poles. Uh, I see the general manager of Frankfurt Utilities and Councilor Todd Corey is here. Do you have anything you'd like to, I guess, give us info on so we're aware of? It, from what they will want to do here, it's, it's mostly just from a safety standpoint during demolition and construction is why they would want these things moved because it would be tough for them and we wouldn't have enough insulators to put up on those lines and then being in the bright sun, sunshine, sunlight during the summer, they would deteriorate, things like that. But it's mostly a safety concern is why they would want these things relocated. What there was an issue with the separation between the where the power currently runs and the building, the building and yes. the ability to get in between that to construct the wall for the new facility. Exactly. This will move that the power further back so there's more space between them. Yeah, it'll go about halfway back through the north side of the parking lot there and get it get it out of the way so that they can uh, work safely. And the change orders for $15,857.99, which is for moving and constructing those poles. Yes. Uh, which change order is misleading because this amount is included in the scope of the whole project. However, we haven't signed the guaranteed maximum price. So we have to accept a change order based on we've only accepted the, um, the management and uh, of the of the project price so far so i'll entertain a motion unless there's comments or questions on this no okay i don't think there's an option to be honest so i'll make the motion that we move forward and approve the uh, ongoing change order number two resolution second okay motion carries three zero last item under new business we have a request from a new beginning ministry for a sign for five days on the southeast corner of Courthouse One. This is for their pork, pork chop dinner. So. Motion to approve. Second. Motion carries to the Okay. Uh, department heads. How many department heads that would like to? Rodney. Real quick, I wanted to update the commissioners. We, we do have a new hire on board for our food inspector in the second week now, Mitch Hong. Uh, I was, I'll have to lasso him to bring him in and get a chance to meet you. He's already out doing inspections and has uh, attended a few other trainings and got some certifications already in a short time or two. Uh, I'm currently advertising for the environmental health position that we split. Uh, and we have interviews set up into this week and, and then the next week so far for those candidates. So I um, wanted to also uh, let the commissioners know, uh, I was notified by State Department of Health that they had money left over from COVID money for their final, which they called supplemental immunization money for not only doing COVID shots, but getting caught up on immunizations we fell behind with for two and a half years. 
they selected only certain counties in the state to receive this uh, carryover money, and Clinton County Health Department is one of those. Awesome. So uh, a couple of the reasons are our rates that we have in immunization currently with the staff that we're currently working with, and they've done an excellent job of keeping us up there where the state wants to see us. Uh, another one of the reasons was the uh, use of the money that we had already received in the past two years uh, for this, because one of the questions they were asking health departments was, how much COVID money still had left over? And of course, I told them I had a little I'm sitting on just in case, but not a lot. They are offering us another $39,000 available to do one more year of additional supplemental immunization type services. Uh, one of the caveats they, the director asked me was, do I think I can spend what little I have left rather easily? And I said, I got some earmark for extended service folks, but I'm here to ask you today, I want to go ahead and spend about 4,500 of it. I think I have 12 altogether, 1,000. Uh, to expedite the changeover of some of our fluorescent lights on our side of the building. I know healthy communities uh, have a program where they're going to eventually over several, a few years rotate and get them all done. But we're in a partnership with them and I'd like to use some of that grant money to just go ahead and expedite going ahead and getting our site changed out. So. I don't have an issue with that. That makes sense to me. Obviously, I'll take that to the council, but they'll obviously want to know, do you, yeah. are you gentlemen aware? I just want to make sure you work. So. Appreciate that. Right. Thanks. So, Rodney, is yeah. it 39000 for just COVID immunization? No, we're all, all, all immunization. Okay. That we right. move back, we continue to realize we're still behind. Uh, and CDC, rather than have to send the money back like you gentlemen just had to do in, in, in an instance, has told the state, if you can find a use for it for a third year opportunity, and you can do so. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't enough money for everyone, but we uh, like to be in that upper echelon yeah. where we get selected. So. Well, thank you for sure. for doing all that work and, and your department being such a high standard that we get selected. I think that's important. We've been very blessed. We've got uh, great people that want to continue to just serve the community and, and look out for their best interests. So. Yeah. Thanks. Thank nice you. Job. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Seen that. Commissioner reports. Okay. I have a couple things, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, on Friday, I had, I don't know if it was a privilege or an honor, um, but FEMA um, director came in and gave us a two and a half hour course on how to uh, apply for the various costs that we had incurred during the disaster. Um, I thought Daryl was going to be here, and to a certain degree, I'm a little bit confused in that the last discussion that I understood, because the governor had already declared Clinton County as a disaster area, we didn't need to disclose that we were, in fact, a disaster area, so there was no resolution that was needed on our part. And Todd, correct me, did that ever get changed? Do we do things? From what I understand, I talked to that Larry, and I can't pronounce his last name, I yeah. apologize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that the declaration that the president signed was for residential. Yeah. And since we are going after for the county for uh, being uh, no not for profits, yeah. Yeah. that we still have to have this turned in by Friday so that they can get into the state and then they're going to come in and audit. But uh, um, I don't, the way I took it from Larry is that you guys did now did not have to sign a declaration or pass a declaration yeah, that's, of disaster. That's how I understood it yeah. as of yesterday was yeah. we didn't need to. But however, that being said, uh, it, it, it was quite involved and uh, regretfully, uh, I was a little bit disappointed in that, you know, we found out about this on Friday of last week and uh, yeah. we have until Friday of this week to turn yeah. in what looks to be about 20 pages of, of stuff. Well, for, fortunately, sorry to interrupt. Fortunately, when uh, this Larry did mention that we could use our own spreadsheets and everything, it that made it simple, that. much simpler for the electric and our departments because out of our software, they're just be able to pull it out, dump it into Excel, and get around it. But uh, one of the deciding factors, the major deciding factor, is is that we have to. Re it was like 147,000 and some change total. Total between all the entities, just not one. All the entities will qualify everybody 
And right now, the electric's sitting somewhere just between 200 and a quarter of a million dollars in expenses for this just alone. So the whole county will qualify and people will be able to get 75, 75 cents on the dollar. That's a we thank you for taking us up and over because I think on the <laughs> county side we would not have made that. that yeah, um, but but uh, it's been quite the experience, that's for sure. And uh, but we're we're just about there. I feel comfortable that we're going to be good by Friday, as long as well. Like Rick said, that he, he's good there, and um, I think all the other departments are following suit. So hopefully we get this one here soon, and we get that money back from people. Right. Um, on the county side, obviously, uh, Highway Department has, and I think you're pretty much close to being finished also, Rick. Is that yeah, correct? We're so we're you'll make that deadline. We're on the signs we lost. And it needs to be given to Daryl Thursday because he has to turn it in on Friday. So I'm not sure what time limit there is or anything. But, you know, it's kind of Thursday would be my thoughts, if at all possible. Um, That's then, what we're shooting for. Right. right. And then, uh, EMA had uh, their forms pretty much done and ready to go too. And outside of that, I was a little disappointed because I asked specifically about Colfax and the volunteer fire department there because, in my opinion, they had a lot of time and effort done. But for some reason, because they were volunteers to the fire department, they didn't qualify for putting it together. So um, at this point, you know, the only one that's really not contributing anything is Colfax Fire Department, which put in several hours and and could have used a little bit of a reimbursement, I would have guessed. But well, I thought that they could still they can go back and get their equipment in the trucks that they use, but they don't they can't turn any hourly time in. Yeah. But they can get something mm -hmm. for all their trucks because they have it broken all the way down to where the chainsaws that our guys use, we can charge X amount of money Excellent. per hour for chainsaws. So maybe Colfax does need to to look at the trucks and in the equipment that they had out yeah. maybe get some but that being said you know um i think we're on target for doing the best we can and recouping whatever we can in that particular case at 75 cents on a dollar yeah so um thanks to the city of throwing us up over the hump the rest of us are just kind of throwing in the light. I, just, I don't know if that's something to be thinking as far as i've heard it's that's a tough situation well i'm glad it was yours and not ours so that <laughs> okay we'll throw it right right. Out there. Yeah. no our guys did a great job and letting it came up and helped us for four days and uh without them we would we would have been hurt i think we our total was 41 broken poles is what we told that at the same time then number two uh, document mountain is a company that i've been working with for quite some time and uh, just so the commissioners know in the past five or six months we've been looking at the mountains of documentations upstairs on the fourth and fifth floor and getting it copied etc and um, i anticipate sometime in the month of may making a formal presentation uh, both to the commissioners and the council as to what we can propose and what we could possibly do so um, in that respect all of the departments met last week and i think pretty much all of us are on board with where we need to go with that so that's the only two things i have sir I'll piggyback a little bit on the FEMA stuff. So this, with that declaration as a disaster county, it opened it up for citizens as well. Yes. Um, for homeowners, if it was a commercial business affected, it's not uh, applicable. But they can go to FEMA.gov and there's an application to apply for for uh, help or support. Um, whether I think it's pretty specific. In, you know, if you don't have insurance on your home, then then FEMA will help cover. But there's also the transition of why you're why you maybe lost your home and you have a temporary residence. There's some financial assistance. So just putting that out there for anyone in the area that had had damage that you there's an application that is now open to Clinton County residents through FEMA.gov. So that is thank you. That's all that I have. And thank you for for, for attending that meeting and uh, heading that out for us. Okay, next up is our uh, claims. We have claims dated uh, April 7th in the amount of $62,472.71. Claims dated April 14th in the amount of $69,264.80. Bi-weekly claims dated April 18th in the amount of $323,562.76. And court claims dated April 18th in the amount of $47,645.96. Motion to approve claims. And second. All right. Motion.
motion carries 3-0 to approve claims. Next, we have payroll from March 24th in the amount of $478,054.34. <coughs> motion to approve payroll. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. All right. Motion carries 3-0 to approve payroll. Uh, lastly, we have our minutes from 4-3. So moved. Second. Motion carries 3 0 to approve the regular minutes from 4 3. Our next meeting will be May 1st and we'll be out here at the airport again. Is there any other business that needs to come before the commission? Okay. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you.